Okay, hi everybody, my name is Adam Fortas, and I am the Instructional Assistant for 1E03, that's Physics 1E03, the first year engineering course. Um, you may remember me from office hours. And today I want to take a bit of a step back from the regular lecture material to show you some of the current research that's going on in the world that uses a lot of the concepts you've been learning this semester. Uh, you may or may not know, but I'm a PhD candidate in the Physics and Astronomy Department here at McMaster. And, uh, you know, I have a, a soft spot for soft matter physics. And so if you haven't heard of that yet, which not uncommon, you might not have, uh, that's a branch of physics that deals with um, how soft and squishy and deformable materials respond to different forces, sort of in a nutshell. Um, that's pretty general um, because the field is huge. Uh, uh, soft matter physicists study things like polymers and fluids and biological materials. Um, that could be like skin, like uh, in this picture here. Uh, we, we can study all sorts of things. Um, so what I'm going to show you today... Uh, it's not my own research, but it's stuff that I found really interesting over the last couple of years. Um, and it actually lines up pretty closely with the content you're learning in your course. Uh, in particular, I want to tell you about the different types of deformable electronics, like printed circuits, which uh, is an example is here on this title screen. Um, something I'm going to call conductive insulators. And then something I'm... <laughs> Another term that I, I don't know if I've heard it somewhere before, but I, I'm calling them liquid metal veins because, uh, you know, th the last two the last two names aren't necessarily how you'll see them described in, in literature or in research papers. But I like them because they give you a, a decent visual of, of what's going on with these technologies. Um, so I'm going to let your imagination run wild for a bit about what those two things are. Uh, will we get some important stuff out of the way? Uh, namely, this lecture is a supplement to the material you're learning in the course. Uh, so I'm going to try to put as much um, one EO3 or first year content into here as possible. But that doesn't mean that there's going to be a ton of equations. Um, in particular, we're going to use what you've learned about resistors, like how resistance of a circuit changes when you add resistors um, in different orientations, like parallel or uh, series. Uh, we also need to talk about resistivity. Uh, so that's a material property. I'm not sure if this has come up in your lectures yet, but it's a material property that um, relates the size and shape of an object to its total resistance. Uh, so when I say a material property, I mean it's something intrinsic to what the object is made out of. So resistivity is independent of its size and shape, but its total resistance is going to be a combination of all of those things. Uh, so we have a little schematic here of this rectangular block. If you have one of these rectangular blocks with a cross-sectional area A and length L, its resistance is going to be equal to its resistivity times the length divided by its area. Um, so you can kind of think about it as like a pipe with some cross-sectional area and some length. You know, the wider the pipe, um, the faster you know, a liquid could flow through it. Um, in other words, a lower resistance. Uh, the last concept we're going to talk about is joule heating, um, or the amount of energy that turns into heat as current goes through a resistor. Uh, so just picture how a toaster works. Um, the heat is going to be related to the voltage, you know, more voltage means more heat, and the current. Or if you want to get resistance into the mix, you can use Ohm's laws to rearrange these equations. And what you'll find is that uh, higher resistance is more heating, and higher current, or current squared, more heating as well. Okay, so that's basically it. Um, so let's jump into this cutting edge research. So, electronics are the present and the future. Uh, we all have them, we all love them, but there's always room for improvement. One thing people are looking for are flexible, deformable electronics. I don't know if you remember uh, hashtag Bendgate back with the iPhone 7s, but uh, you know, if an iPhone could flex and bend like rubber, then this person's Christmas wouldn't have been ruined. Um, and it's not just this guy. Uh, a lot of people want a flexible iPhone. Unfortunately, the physics of materials currently limits what we can do with flexible electronics, especially, you know, ones that you carry around in your pocket. Um, but, you know, we would like flexible electronics more th for more reasons than just, uh, you know, making a better iPhone. Um, you can imagine 
Just imagine what you could do if you had flexible, deformable, and tiny electronics in, you know, a medical device, for, ex for example. Uh, so yeah, what if you put a super deformable small electronic into um, a device like this? Well, here's a few schematics and a few actual images of medical devices um, that use this kind of technology or are trying to use this type of technology. Um, a lot of these technologies come down to putting sensors into delicate deformable places like around your heart um, in this like middle lower image um, embedded in, in various muscles or um, on your throat in some cases. Uh, so what are the, the criteria that you really want to be hitting when you make a device like this? Well, you want the embedded device you want the device to be small, you know, bendable, stretchable. Basically, you want it to be able to move with the biological material that it's embedded in. And of course, the smaller the better. You don't want some big honking thing sticking out in your, uh, your chest cavity. Um, so you'll notice I said stretchable and bendable. Um, might not recognize the difference right away. This is kind of a soft matter thing. Um, so I'm going to talk about that in a second. But um, we can kind of zoom forward and, and start talking about what kind of solutions people have come up with. Uh, so the first example that we're going to talk about is the uh, printable circuits like we saw on the, the title page here. So the first example here is just this, uh, you know, this printed gold circuit on somebody's skin. You can see those little fingers and the wrinkles of the skin. So this is basically just printed onto the skin. The gold stuff there is conductive, and since it's so, so incredibly thin, it can bend with human skin. It's small, but uh, generally these kinds of circuits aren't that stretchy. Uh, so you can kind of see that the gold pattern there has some waviness to it. That's a design de decision to help with the circuit, um, to help the circuit respond to skin stretching. But that's not really the same thing as being able to stretch the circuit. Uh, so this is probably a good time to talk about what the difference is between stretching and bending. I don't want to go too deep into it. Uh, this gets kind of, you know, mathy and physicsy, and, and this is my jam. But uh, this isn't really the point of the the uh, presentation right now. But uh, just think about, you know, hair or um, tin foil or paper. That's something that you can bend pretty easily, but it's not going to stretch super well. So. The things that uh, you know, hair, tin foil, and paper have in common, they're very thin, uh, but they're stiff materials. So when we say bending, think thin, and we say stretching, think soft. So something like a rubber or, um, you know, skin. Uh, okay, so the printed on circuits work for some things, but they're not super stretchy. So can we find something that's stretchy and also conductive? Well, maybe. So. What we really want is something that stretches and deforms like silly putty. And um, the problem with that, though, is silly putty and polymers are generally not really conductive. They're, for the most part, insulators. So they don't really carry a current. Um, it would be a good material otherwise. You can, you know, picture playing around with silly putty. You can even see them here. You know, you can squish it flat against some paper. You can stretch it. You can do all sorts of stuff. Stick it into an egg. Um, you can cut it up super small, but it's not really all that conductive. But um, but hold on, though. We were just talking about printed circuits, and I don't know if you've ever done this with Silly Putty, um, but this was probably my first experience with uh, <laughs> unlicensed copyright infringement. But, uh, but maybe we can use this technique as inspiration for our circuits. So what we're seeing here is uh, Silly Putty being stuck onto um, old-fashioned newsprint. And the ink doesn't stay on the newsprint super well. It actually comes off onto the silly putty. So this kind of sounds like the printed circuit. So we're, you know, printing um, onto the silly putty. So we know that printed circuits aren't necessarily stretchy. So what if we kind of take the next step and, and think about instead of printing in the putty, what if we put a bunch of these conductive particles and, you know, distribute them throughout the silly putty? What if we make sort of a, a silly putty conductive particle um, mess, a little soup of some sort. Could you make it carry current? So yeah, kind of, it kind of works. So the idea here, um, this is what I'm going to call a conductive insulator. So basically we're taking an insulator, which is our you know rubber or polymer, 
and we're doing something to it to make it conductive. Um, so the strategy in, you know, in a nutshell, I guess you could say, is uh, we take a bunch of conductive particles. So these could be like little metal particles or, you know, some sort of nanoparticle, um, something that's conductive. And you just blend a whole bunch of it in there. Um, and when you do that, you can see here in this green and white schematic here, the more particles you add, um, you start getting these networks setting up, these linked networks. So basically the green particles are going to touch more and more friendly green particles. Um, and when these sort of networks form, this is what's called percolation. Um, just like coffee, if you, you know, have a percolator at home. Um, but basically the more particles you include, the higher chance that more particles are going to be touching. And if they span the whole length of uh, the insulator, then you've got yourself a conductive chain, and that's a lot like a wire. Okay, so let's try to make this a little quantitative, uh, because as a lecture, we're, we have to make this a bit quantitative. Um, so let's build a model to try to, uh, try to understand how these guys work. So we'll take our square box with our conductive particles, that's our conductive insulator, and attach it to a battery where the, the wires are on either side of the, uh, the insulator. And now we're gonna, we want to know how much current is flowing through this guy. Uh, so if we had no conductive particles, if no green dots were inside of this box, then the resistance of this, this box is going to be infinite. There's no way for current to go across. Uh, and so there's no flow. As we add more particles, high, we get a higher chance of creating a network of these particles. And so the first time you have this full complete network, we can think of this as, you know, having one resistor that's spanning this, um, this insulator. Okay, so anytime I draw a red line like that, think of that as just an, uh, a resistor. So now we have, you know, a voltage source and we have a resistor. What if we add more particles? Well, if we keep adding more and more particles, we're going to get more and more connections from one side of the insulator to the other. Um, so we can think of these new connections and these new red lines as additional resistors. And if you're adding more and more resistors from one end to the other end, is that like adding them in series or parallel? Well, if you're looking at the slide right now, you'll probably guess parallel because that's what I wrote down on the slide. Um, but yeah, that, that's basically the idea. You have a bunch of resistors lined up side by side, a current will come in on one edge of the, you know, the box and it'll see all these different resistors that it can go across. And so, you know, the more green particles we add, the more resistors we have set up in parallel. And the more resistors in parallel, the lower the total resistance across this thing is going to be. Cool? Okay, so we can actually think of it as um, with another model. And this one is going to relate to resistivity. So instead of thinking about these connections as a bunch of resistors, we can think of the whole bulk, the whole insulator thing as, as one object and think about it in terms of material properties. And this is a little bit closer to, I think how more you know, people in the literature would think about these sorts of uh, devices. Um, so what you have here is if you have a block of this uh, conductive insulator, we'll say that it's rectangular and it has some cross-sectional area A and some length L, just like this uh, schematic I've drawn in the top right corner. And as you add more particles, what's that going to do to its resistivity? So remember, resistivity is this material property that says, you know, this material, if you build something out of this material, it has this intrinsic amount of resistance, you know, per unit length. Okay, so what are we changing when we add the particles? We're not changing length, we're not changing cross-sectional area, but we are changing resistivity. And is it going to go up or down if we add more conductive particles? It's going to go down. Okay, so these two models basically say the same thing. Um, and this is, you know, one strategy that um, researchers are using to try to make these stretchable, flexible, um, you know, electronic devices. Um, it's not an ideal solution, though. And um, I'll give you a, a, th a second to think about it. And I want you to think about it in terms of uh, this analogy here. I don't know if you've ever played with Play-Doh and gotten it dirty or a bunch of sand in it. Um, 
Well, adding all these conductive particles into your polymer is kind of like getting sand in your Play-Doh. So, what does that do to your Play-Doh? Well, you start losing a lot of the, the fun. You start losing a lot of the attractive, squishy, flexible properties. You can see here with this, uh, you know, this little castle, it's cracking and fracturing, and it's not really deforming as well as, uh, as, well as you'd like. So, you know, this is a technique that's useful, but it's, um, you know, it's not a home run solution that, you know, fixes everything and it's going to be put into every type of circuit. It's going to have its uses, but it's, uh, it's not exactly what we're looking for right now. Okay, so this brings me to the third topic that I wrote down on the, uh, the title slide here, and kind of the inspiration for this whole lecture. So last year, I, uh, I got an article published in Physics Today. This is a physics magazine. Um, it basically talks about what's going on in the world of physics. Uh, it's not original research. It's mostly, you know, people writing about other people's research. So this is what I was doing. Um, and I was inspired to write this. I was, you know, flipping through some, uh, some primary literature and looking at uh, what people are doing in the, the world of flexible electronics. And I saw this really cool research paper that, uh, you know, instead of printing on circuits or instead of embedding a bunch of particles into polymers, they said, what if we use liquid metal and we made these, you know, little channels or these cavities filled with liquid metal and just use those as circuit um, or sorry, as, as wires to pass current. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really smart. Because, I mean, liquid metal, right? It's a liquid, so it flows and it, you know, deforms into whatever shape or, you know, channel that you put it in. And it's metal, so it's conductive. Uh, yeah, so it seems, you know, seems like a home run. Let's, let's give that a shot. So this is what the, the Dickey group presumably thought. Um, they're from North Carolina State University. And, um... What this research paper that I wrote about, uh, this came out in, I think, 2019, what they did is what I basically just described. They embedded liquid metal, in this case, gallium indium eutectic, into a uh, PDMS substrate. And PDMS is just a fancy name for a, you know, a rubbery silicone material. It's polydimethyl siloxane, to be exact, if you want to you know, look that up. But it's basically like a, a silicon, silicone... Um, rubbery material. It's actually very similar to skin. Um, you can make it in a couple different ways, but uh, it's usually it's sometimes used as a, a skin model. Uh, so what they, they also included a special color changing pigment that responds to temperature change. And that was sort of to add a visual cue for the circuit that responds to joule heating. So that's the other keyword that I brought up in the second slide here. Um, so it's a nice visual cue to see current flowing through these circuits, uh, but it also has another cool feature that uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave as a little surprise for later. But first, let's talk about how these circuits work, and uh, specifically the joule heating. So this is something that could come up on your exam, but uh, just a quick reminder, and this is just a, a page taken from Wikipedia. Um, the joule heating, basically, when you pass current through a material that has some resistance. It's going to heat up. It's going to, you know, uh, lose some energy to heating. Uh, the heat it generates is going to be related to the voltage and current. Or we can use Ohm's law to uh, rearrange this equation to write it as a function of current squared and resistance. Again, this is how your toaster works. And this is a picture of a toaster filament. And, uh, I mean, it's also why you would need, you know, computer fans and... Um, vents on your on your computer anything that passes current through it is likely going to start heating up okay anyway uh the stretchable material uh the pdms has this thermal pigment in it which is going to change with heat so the researchers in this um, image here from the the actual paper they've created these patterned channels with the pdms and filled them with the liquid metal and then when they pass a current through these liquid metal veins, uh, they can observe a, a color change. So the little inset shows that uh, the materials can also bend and stretch, which is super nice. So, you know, qualitatively, the, the idea works. Um, but of course, we want to be able to quantify stuff like uh, resistance, um, the resistance in these veins. Uh, you need to be able to, you know, understand stuff a little bit more numerically to be able to build 
uh, more useful devices. So this is a perfect opportunity to use some of your one EO3 uh, lessons that you've, you know, you've had over the last little bit. So if we want to start building this model, um, a good place to start is uh, thinking about resistance and resistivity. So we can rewrite the resistance in terms of the resistivity, the length of the liquid metal vein, and its cross-sectional area. So that's what we're going to start with. Uh, and let's try to test this model. Let's do some experiments. So we talked a lot about temperature change. Um, with this dual heating, we, we uh, would expect temperature change to scale with the current squared. Uh, so they run this experiment here where they make veins of different sizes and pass different amounts of current through them. And then they measure the, uh, the change in temperature uh, around these liquid metal veins. So we're changing a few things here. Uh, we're changing the width, and that's going to change the resistance. So a thicker vein means a lower resistance. So we would expect less temperature change. And so that's kind of what we see on this plot here um, with the different colors. The 0.2 millimeter vein heats up a lot faster than the 1.0 millimeter vein. Uh, so now let's think about changing current. And that's the x-axis here. So we said the temperature should be proportional to the current squared. So what they're doing here is plotting the temperature versus current squared. Uh, if we use you know, an equation of a line to try to figure out what's going on here, uh, you know, y equals mx plus b. Uh, y is the temperature change. m is going to be the slope. And what's that going to be? It's going to be the resistance, or the, you know, the resi resistivity times length divided by area. And what's x going to be? x is going to be current squared. That's what they've chosen. So if x is current squared, and we're changing around uh, current, would you expect a quadratic equation, or would you expect a straight line? So if it's current squared, then you want to you want to see a straight line here, and that's exactly what they've gotten in this uh, this plot here. Uh, so you know, the model looks pretty good. Oh, pop quiz: uh, What should b be in y equals mx plus b in this model? Yeah, that's right. B should be zero. They should all go through zero. Okay, so this looks pretty good. Let's uh, let's run some more experiments, some more tests. Uh, you know, if we make this sort of rectangular, um, stretchable uh, material thing with a, a vein running through it, and we put it between two clamps and we stretch it, uh, we can see through this color change here that um, you know current is still running through this guy, uh, even at I think they go to 140. 140% increase in length. Uh, they bring it back to uh, its original length, and it you know it seems to work pretty well. It doesn't break down at any point, so it looks like a pretty nice stretchable electronic device. So let's go back to our um, our criteria for you know a generic medical device. So this example is not small. This is you know something you could hold with your hands. You wouldn't want to put this into somebody's body, of course. Uh, so this example isn't really small, but there's nothing about this, as far as I can tell, that would stop it from being made small. Um, as long as the researchers could make, you know, thin, controlled liquid metal wires, uh, I, I could imagine you putting that in any sort of geometry. Uh, in fact, that's actually one of the, uh, the directions that the Dickey Lab is going in. One of their more recent papers that came out is... Uh, you know, being able to make these liquid metal wires in, in different ways. Uh, so they're working on it. They're working on it. Um, but the other criteria, you know, check marks all around. You can make it bendable, stretchable. It conducts. It seems quite promising. Uh, but wait, wait a minute. Astute. <laughs> if you're, you know, looking really closely, you might have noticed that uh, at 0% strain and at 140% strain, the colors are not the same. Um, so what this might tell you is that maybe the resistance is changing. It seems like the heating is, is you know, not the same amount of heating. Um, so is there more heating going on? It seems like there is. So why is that? Well, remember that the resistance of the vein isn't just a resistivity thing. 
It also depends on the geometry. So this vein is getting longer. Um, and that's, you know, if we're changing the length, that's changing the total resistance. Okay, so there's another thing now we have to quantify. We're not out of the woods yet. We don't have a, a full solution, full understanding of these guys yet. So let's make another model. Um, we're going to have to jump back into, you know, hardcore soft matter physics. That's a weird way of saying it, but we're going to have to jump back into some uh, physics of stretching. So I'm going to tell you, um, in this case, we're going to treat volume as being conserved. So the volume of a liquid metal vein isn't going to change no matter what we do to it, uh, stretch it, compress it. I don't want to go too deep into this, but this ends up being a pretty good assumption. Um, it has to do with, you know, conservation of, um, like a material conservation. Uh, we're not adding any material, we're not losing any material. And if we assume that the you know, distance between um, bonds on like a molecular scale aren't changing too much, then this is going to be a pretty good assumption. So this is usually true of liquids. Um, we can talk about whether this is true or how this changes with different materials um, during an office hour or something. But for this case, in this case, let's just assume that it's true. Um, but this has some repercussions when you start stretching these liquid metal veins. So say we take this, uh, you know, this rectangle, this, um, this uh, device, and we start stretching it. If the volume is going to stay the same, uh, and we increase the length of the vein, then the cross-sectional area is going to decrease. Now, if we think about the resistance of the whole device as a function of geometry and resistivity, uh, we aren't changing the material properties. It's still the same uh, material. The liquid metal is not changing, so its resistivity is staying the same this time. Um, but the shape of it is changing. It's getting longer, which increases resistance, and its cross-sectional area is decreasing, or it's getting narrower which also increases the resistance. So we rewrite the resistance in terms of length and volume and look at um, you know, how the total resistance changes. And what we would expect is a quadratic change, um, a quadratic change in the resistance as you change uh, the length. So what, all we did here was we took the resistance equals resistivity times length divided by area and we substituted in uh, length divided by volume for our area. This is the um, you know, constant volume assumption. And that's where you get the length squared here. Okay, so let's test this model now. Um, so if the, um, so what these researchers do is they measure the change in resistance versus the strain, which is pretty much proportional to the change in length of these um, these liquid metal wires and you know it looks pretty good to me it's not a straight line it's got some curvature to it uh, yeah so it so it seems to, to work appropriately so the more you stretch it the higher the resistance is and so the more heating you're getting so awesome we understand it um, but it's not you know it's maybe not the best for all devices so picture, you say, 20 years from now or something, and you have your bendable iPhone, and you're you know, flicking through Twitter or something, and the screen starts to dim because you, know, you squeezed it too much or something. Or you're listening to a podcast, and the volume starts going crazy, and it's just because you sat down and it bended a little bit. Uh, it's not super useful in all devices for you know, the voltages or currents or resistances of devices to change when you squish them and stuff it i feel like engineering with that in mind is going to be pretty difficult here's something that sort of sets the you know these researchers apart from you know where my brain went uh this is you know kind of an enviable skill and i i really encourage you to you know think about you know looking for silver linings if you will but uh in their paper the the dickey group you know they thought hard about um whether they could turn this, you know, bug into a feature. And I actually think that there is some merit to this, uh, this feature that they describe. So, so here's the pitch. We're going to pitch this, uh, this bug as a feature. Okay, so starting off, did you know 
that a decapitated octopus is still able to grab food and try to deliver it to where its mouth would be. Yeah, so that's pretty weird. I don't know if you knew that. But basically, you know, an octopus's brain isn't all in its head. It's actually distributed through its arms as well. Uh, so this lets them offload some of the decisions that, you know, my head or your head would have to make to its arms. And this makes a lot of sense if you have, you know, eight ultra-stretchable, deformable, uh, weirdo octopus arms that need to coordinate and not get tangled up. Uh, so, hey, maybe, maybe we can use these stretchable electronics to do something kind of octopus-like. So let's let our imagination run wild again and think about these medical devices. So what if we could make medical sensors and devices that are like the octopus in that, uh, you know, you don't have to have them connected to a central computer to have them work. So again, look at these things, the, the places where you might put a sensor, you know, around the heart or uh, on the skin or, you know, in your, your throat near your vocal cords. If you could make a sensor that, you know, responds to stimulus and doesn't have to have a you know, a computer attached to it, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty good. You could potentially make, you know, sensors that are small and cheap and computationally, it might be useful to offload some decision-making processes, uh, and keep it, you know, local to where deformations are happening. So this is what the, the Dickey group tries to explore here. Uh, so this is a little bit of a complicated slide, but, um, I'll try to walk you through it. So basically, they built a little circuit as a proof of concept that takes different finger presses and gives different outputs. Uh, so it takes inputs, processes the information, and gives a different output depending on the input. Sounds a lot like a computer. So A and B that are labeled here are two different current carrying locations that kind of act as the, the pressure sensors. So if you press either one, you're changing the way that the current is able to flow through those locations. And that redirects the electrical energy um, through the circuit and changes what uh, location C actually ends up seeing. So based on what you do, pressing A or B, you get different colored outputs. This is actually what they found, and this is a picture of the actual device that they made. Uh, so if you press neither A or B, if you press nothing and you just pass current through it, uh, C looks purple. If you press the A button, so to speak, you get blue. So there's a little bit more heating going on. If you press A and B at the same time, you get white. Even more current goes to this location. Kind of cool, huh? So you can imagine putting something at location C, um, some sort of sensor that gives different outputs or, you know, does different things depending on the voltage or the current that gets to it. Um, it's kind of like an octopus, right? It has the potential. Okay, so there's no homework associated with this lecture, but there is, you know, a little practice exercise that uh, I would encourage you to try. Um, so the, the exercise is, why don't you show this to somebody that you know? Um, I'll share the lecture slides with you in the video and, you know, all the other resources you might need, but um, bonus points if the person you show it to is not in engineering or not in your class. See, this is, this is some high quality research. Um, and yet, most of the stuff that we talked about can be explained with uh, some of the things that you've learned in your, your first year course. Uh, so even if you don't go ahead and, you know, try this little exercise here. Uh, I hope you found it interesting, and I hope this also encourages you um, that what you're learning, you know, is leading you somewhere. You know, real research isn't this far off thing that you can't contribute to or understand until you graduate. It's actually, you know, uh, it rewards people who, you know, use existing knowledge and information in clever new ways. It's a relatively simple concept in this paper, but, uh, you know, it's kind of a first of its kind in a sense, and you know, it made its way to nature communication. So I don't know, hopefully that's like a, a rewarding little <laughs> life lesson or something. Um, but yeah, if you do want to try this, um, I'm open to uh, hearing your you know, descriptions. If you wanna you know, present to me, we can do that at an office hour or something, but uh, you know, give it a shot. Communicating your research is really important. So, you know, the earlier you start trying it, the, the better you're going to be at it. 
anyway that's all we have for this lecture um thanks so much for listening i hope you enjoyed it um if you want to read more research papers uh explained for like an undergraduate audience or something i really encourage you to check out the uh the science bites galaxy here um it's a collection of blogs written by graduate students like me uh all different subject matters you know the first one i think was astronomy so that's astro bites here but there's um you know chem bites and there's uh oncology bites there's soft bites which i write for uh that's soft matter physics but basically any kind of science that you're interested in you can find a blog uh devoted to taking you know new and exciting research and uh explaining it in a you know giving you little research summaries so that's the the soft bites and the science bites networks uh i also have a website i try to do a similar thing all sorts of different research that's scientificcanada.ca um, i mentioned that this lecture was inspired by a physics today article i'll link to that article um and if you want to see more of the writing that i do you can head to scientificcanada.ca or fortis.com uh, a little bit about me, I guess, is that I'm, I'm looking to get into science writing, like science journalism. So uh, this is kind of practice for me as well. So hopefully I explained it well to you. I, I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. Um, we'll share all of this material on Avenue and in the, um, what do you call it, the Microsoft Teams channel. Um, but for people who are not in the class that end up seeing this somehow, you can head to scientificcanada.ca slash 1E03. I'll host all of the uh, the videos and the transcripts and stuff for, uh, for this little lecture here. Um, I'll host it over on that URL. So, yeah, I encourage you to download it. And uh, if you have any comments or questions or you want to chat about physics or engineering or, I don't know, writing, science writing, uh, let me know. Hit me up. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as well, at Adam Fortas. So thanks again. Uh, hope you enjoy and we'll see you in class.